Okay, so did that kill the music on the stream? Did you mute the music? Okay, so if you muted the music, it's probably not on the stream anymore. If you muted the music, it's probably not on the stream anymore, right? So what we'll need to do is, you'll just need to bring, um, And I'm, and I'm muted on the stream now? Yes, okay, perfect. So let's do, we'll do the quick check here. My metronome is good, pad. You can hear? Sorry? Um, Tom, is the, is the music still muted on the stream? Can you hear me talking right now on the stream? I know it's gonna be delayed, but. sound check and then as I'm sound checking you can go back and unmute all the stuff again just to make sure it, nothing interferes and he's coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. All right. Good, Jason.
just wow I'm hot let's come down a little bit that's really hot okay keep talking all the way through is it comfortable for everybody out there because it's okay great feels a little loud to me but that's uh, that's all good everything is good and we want to make sure that my S's and my T's aren't hurting people's ears because the whistle and do I need to keep talking? I'm just looking at you guys. Just keep talking until I'll just say one, two, three, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Genesis. We want Acts and John, Luke, Mark, Matthew. And we want to talk about Revelation today. No, actually, we're not going to. We're not doing Revelation, not today. Okay, that's fine. No revelation today. Just waiting for... Waiting to discover. Are we good? And I think I need to keep talking. I don't really know. I'm just going to keep talking here. Because that's what talking does. Talky, talky, talk. Talky, talk. Talk, talk. That is interesting. Oh, you guys get to sit at the top at the back. Wonderful. Yay. It's kind of fun up there. I wish I could do service up there. Are we good? I don't know. We don't know if we're, we don't know if we're good. And I just have to keep on talking. And everything. Okay, we're good. Thank you. I'm not shutting off my mic at all today, so you guys control the mutes back there.
Good morning, Promise Church. We are so glad that you have been able to join with us today, whether it's at home, in your living room, or maybe in your car, or if it is here at uh, our location at 66 Berry Street in Bradford, Ontario. We are so glad that you've joined with us today. And uh, we do expect that God is here with us. The expectation today is that we didn't come to church today because, you know, we had nothing better to do. You didn't tune in on YouTube because it was just a religious routine that you go through. We come to church on a Sunday expecting that God is going to speak to us, to meet with us, and to be with us today. And so as we come and we worship together today, I invite you to to participate with your heart, with your mind, with your emotions, and with every part of you, participate in the act of worship of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me pray before I invite Devin to lead us in, in songs of worship. Lord Jesus, today we come to you and we commit ourselves afresh. We come to you and we say, God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have provided for us in the person of Jesus. We come to you and we say, if there's anything in my heart today, God, purify me. If there's anything that needs to be changed, change me. And God, for everything that is within me, I pray that it would come to worship you. God, I pray that we would be a people that worship you and continually thank you for your gracious love to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Rob. Promise, it's good to be back with you this morning. Um, I'm going to ask that you stand this morning as we come together in worship. And just to echo what Rob said, promise we're here with an expectation. God is here this morning, and we're going to celebrate that together. So let's sing. Sing, he's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Yes, we believe it this morning, Jesus. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And 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 
who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Yes, Jesus. never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God let's sing your promise and all my life you have been faithful Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I love your voice. I love your voice. And you have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, let's sing it this morning. Your goodness. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that again. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yes, God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing 
of the goodness of God. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Jesus. And I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree and his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone i'll sing your promise with all you've got oh praise the name Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. the third at break of dawn the son of heaven rose again yes he did oh trampled death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ our King and oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed Jesus face and oh praise the name of the lord our god oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god oh praise the name Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Jesus. God, we worship you this morning with all that we are. God, we praise your holy name. You are good. God, you are, you are everything for us. And God, we thank you for being with, your, being with us this morning here in this place, here with us at home. God, we thank you that we can experience you every day of our lives at any moment. God, all we, gotta, all we have to do is reach out and ask for you to be with us. 
We thank you, God, for that freedom and that comfort. And God, we declare that you are holy and you are worthy this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Promise. You may be seated. Wonderful. Well, as we hear and, and worship God because he is great and his, his greatness is so wonderful, that song speaks of the hope, the blessed hope that we have. And today we're going to uh, do a spiritual practice called Lectio Divina. And the practice is meant for us to hear the word of the Lord in a fresh way. And today the passage we're going to read today is fairly familiar. It's a passage that you may know off by heart or have heard well enough to know the cadence of. But today I, I, I ask you to in your heart listen to the voice of God. Listen to what God draws out in the detail of the text in the first reading. Where, where we want to see what's going on from, from God's perspective. We, we don't want to analyze it. We just want to see what is, what is God saying, what is happening from God's perspective in this passage right here. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who went before you. you know, I want you to, if you're with anybody at home, I want you to just sit and talk with the people at home for a minute. And if you're with people here, then I want you to just talk with the people here for a minute and answer the question, what is happening in this passage. What just happened there? passage one more time here. The purpose of reading it the second time is to really get into it and find yourself in the passage. See, God wants you to locate yourself in Scripture in this discipline. And you locate yourself in the passage. Find where you are. And so here, let's, let's read again. Seeing the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. 
And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I want to encourage you with the people you were just talking to. Now I want to encourage you to locate yourself in the passage. Who are you in this passage? this one more time. And I'm going to really push this time. Because this time is now that you've heard the passage and you're familiar with it. Now you've listened to it twice and you've placed yourself in it. Now the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Holy Spirit wants to give you something in this passage that's for you, that's for your building. God wants to meet with you right now and talk to you and tell you something from his word. And so here's where, where we quiet our hearts and we read it one more time and say, God, what do you say to me right now from this passage? Seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now sit on this for one minute. Sit on it. What is God saying to you?
now take a moment and share with the people around you what you feel that God was saying to you and be blessed. You didn't tell them, okay. <laughs> Just wipe that one under the carpet. <laughs> Especially with all that candy they made have consumed last night. They might be wired today. Good luck, parents. Um, so I'm wearing a crazy my daughter's rainbowy sweater today because I don't have anything this crazy in my closet. Today, downstairs, we're going to be talking about a story that includes a rainbow. I'm sure some of you have figured it out by now. We will be talking about Noah today. And we've been talking about heroes of the Bible. And today's hero is Noah. And we've also been talking about how each of the characters that we talk about, we're drawing from it a characteristic. Two weeks ago, we talked about Daniel and how he was trustworthy. Last week, we talked about Ruth and her kindness. This week, Kids, I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but we are going to talk about Noah. We'll see what characteristic we have this week. We're going to talk about rainbows and what it means. Next week, moms and dads, if you can dig onto those dusty shelves somewhere and encourage your kids to bring a Bible to church. Everybody's Bible looks a little bit different. And the, the Promise kids have seen this Bible a number of times before. There's many, many stories that go behind this Bible that's actually is a Bible in there. It's not just duct tape, I promise. It's been all around the world and back and uh, can tell many, many stories uh, outside and in. And um, moms and dads, I want to instill in your kids some Bible truths. And next week we're going to, um, our craft is going to be straight out of the Bible, that something that they're going to be looking for specifically. So if you can encourage your kids to bring a Bible, a physical Bible, to church next week, that would be fantastic. I will have extras just in case you forget, but that would be highly encouraged, okay? Um, something that I should probably apologize for, moms and dads that are viewing from home. In the craziness of getting adjusted back to church in real life, um, it completely slipped my mind, so I apologize to those who are still at home, but um, I haven't been sending out uh, some activity sheets to the kids who are at home, so I'm going to start doing that. I, start, I will be sending one out this afternoon as soon as I get back home. I have one on Noah for those of you who are viewing from home today, so those will be coming. Again, I apologize. Um, so kids, Give mom and dad high five, hugs, kisses, whatever you need to do. Say, see you soon. We're going downstairs to have some fun. And moms and dads, have a little bit of a break. 
chat amongst yourselves while the kids and I go downstairs. Wonderful. Well, thank you for taking part in that break and for connecting with others in our socially distanced way here and at home. Thanks for uh, maybe you got a drink or a snack or something. I'm not sure what you did in that break. Or maybe you just watched the announcement loop. It's pretty entertaining. Um, but we're, we're glad to be 
to be back and we're glad to be here. At this point in our service, we are taking up our tithes and offerings and we don't do it here by passing anything any longer, but we do encourage people to give on our tablet, which is um, it's our website at promisechurch.community. Uh, That's our portal and you go down to the green tab and you hit give. And make sure that in your drop downs you select Willowdale, or you select, sorry, you select Promise Church, because if you don't select Promise Church, it goes to Willowdale Pentecostal Church. And so we want to make sure that, that uh, your giving and your contribution to the work of God here in Bradford gets directed appropriately. And God is so good. Uh, we, have, we have seen God provide in stunning ways. One of the transitions that happened for us, which we're so thankful that you have been um, so accommodating and working with us, one of the transitions that's happened is that we have, um, we had to invest in some online material and it wasn't cheap, but God came through in, in putting it in people's hearts and minds that this was a need of the church and, uh, and people were able to, to give generously and we saw, we saw enough come in that we were able to put this all live stream and we're, we're learning it better and better every single week. And so we thank you for that. And every single time you give as, an, as, a, as a willing participant in what God is doing, God honors that. So we encourage you to go online and do that. You can do it either monthly, weekly, or just as one-offs. And, uh, and that gets taken care of. Let me pray. Um, I'm going to pray for provision for you and provision for the church because God is the one who is faithful. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for everything that you have done. And in a world where we are so blessed with material things, we, we thank you and we know that you are our provider. And we know that you are the one who is good, who is doing the work. So God, we, we trust you and we honor you with our finances we offer them back to you and say thank you, Jesus, for your provision and, and thank you for the, for the opportunity to partner with what you are doing here at Promise Church. And so we thank you for that opportunity today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I only have a couple of announcements and the first one is to join us on our online community on Slack. If you are not yet on Slack or you have not heard of Slack, it is a communication app that allows for a certain number of people to come in and have a community and have discussions. And we want to encourage you to take part in Slack. Right now, my phone has been going off all service because people who are live streaming and people who are here in the sanctuary are participating on Slack and talking to each other. And so we want to give you that invite. The way you do it is you go to promisechurch.community. In the Get Connected tab, you scroll down to the Get Connected tab and you see the join the conversation slack button um, it does take an application it's going to take a few days for you to get back involved but by next week you'll be in slack having conversations with the rest of our church community and uh, it is a blessing i mean if you've looked on slack today you will see pictures of our youngest promised church person um, she was asleep in the picture and it's really adorable and uh and so we just encourage you to do that. The other piece is we want you to find places to serve. So much of our Christian experience is found in serving. It's found in saying that the whole world isn't centered on me and what I get and what I want, but it's centered on the idea of serving together um, with a common mission. And so if you don't yet have a place that you're serving, then I encourage you to go onto promisechurch.community find your place to serve, and scroll through the effective classifieds that are there. We have great opportunities for you to learn new things and hobbies and, and things that you could do, like media stuff or camera work. We've got great opportunities to expand social opportunities like greeting and children care and, well, that's even more responsibility than just social, which is awesome. Um, and you can just do so many different things here at the church and even outside of the church. So find a place to serve, and I really want to encourage you with that. All right. Done with that. All done. All right. That was the old youth pastor trick. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so God has, has definitely uh, been present in the past couple of services. 
And the thing with the past couple services is we've been talking about death. And it's, you know, it's not the, the happiest thing in the world, but it's important. And, you know, that's been, that's been really highlighted to me as we have, uh, as, as we've experienced this week here in Bradford. You know, last week in the sermon, I said that we often talk about death and say, not in my backyard. And we push it off and don't think about it. And little did I know that a couple of days later, we would literally be asked to search our backyard for a missing child. Little did I know that we would be asked to look in sheds and places that somebody could hide or, or if you have a trailer or an RV on your property, that, that you were asked to search there for Siam. I had no idea that, that, we, that on Friday especially, and yeah, even Saturday, no, sorry, Friday especially, there would be low-flying helicopters, like ridiculously low-flying helicopters all over town for this boy who went missing, only to be found dead. Last week I said, sometimes we pray away valid complaints. We want to just soothe over pain so quickly that we just pray away valid complaints and we don't actually take a moment to think and grieve and recognize that, that this isn't okay. It's not what it's supposed to be. So we find ourselves surrounded by a story of darkness, and I know that this has affected people in this community. Here at this church, I know this, this has pulled on us. And it's, and it's valid, and it sucks because we are surrounded by such darkness, and we want to do something because we're human. We want to make it right. And we have to grieve, and we have to say, God this isn't okay. It's not okay. And we need to find space in our church experience where we actually can say, that's not supposed to happen. And so today I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then I'm going to, to lead us through a sermon that talks about Jesus and leads us all the way through this crazy, dark, sad story. God, today we come with our vicarious hurts that are real. None of us are related to this family directly, but we still hurt. And so, God, we come and we honestly say we hurt. This was not supposed to happen. But then we also hurt compassionately as well. We hurt because we put ourselves in the position of the parents and the siblings and the grandparents and the uncles and the aunts and, and our heart rends with pain and we say, God, how long, O oh Lord, do we allow things to go wrong in this world? How long, God, does evil seem to continue to happen? How long, O oh Lord? God, this is not okay. And so we put this at your feet because you're the only one who can actually do anything about it. The only things we can do is offer prayer and offer compassion. We get to offer prayer and we get to offer compassion, but it still doesn't remove the fact that this great sorrow and darkness has happened. So, Jesus, we put it at your feet. And we say, God, intervene. Jesus, please return soon. We look for you to you to remove evil from this world because you are our only hope. You are the hope. You are the hope that we hold on to because you are the one who removes evil from the world. You are the one who overcomes death. You are the one who makes all things right and comes and lives with us. You are the one who actually is involved. And so, God, we pray that you would come quickly and resolve this terrible darkness. And Jesus, 
We pray for a compassionate heart. We pray for the strength to be compassionate to Sam's family. We pray for the, for the creativity and the wisdom to know what to do to offer comfort. And so we pray that, that as you give us opportunity that we would be there in person or in prayers or in well wishes on social media or whatever capacity you ask us to be there and pray that we, you would be there. And for our own hearts, I pray that you would soothe us and bind us and help us see the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text today never changed. And there are elements of this service that have changed, but our text today never changed because the text is true. Let me read to you today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. It says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve the way that others grieve, as those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so even through Jesus, God will bring with him those that have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord therefore encourage each other with these words you know we want to we want to take a moment and 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 thank the people who were able to you know take a package to Sam's family before the the news broke you know we want to thank you for that because that is a show of compassion and all of us felt like we were part of a community joining with you in that. And so thank you, because that was important. Today, we're talking about the hope that we have for those who are experiencing darkness. And if there was ever a promise that is real for us today, this is it. Encourage each other with these words. I, I've been working with teenagers for 16 years before I went to school and I stopped working with teenagers because I wanted to become a, a lead pastor and, and God put this church plant on my heart. But in my 16 years of working with teenagers, I, I learned that youth take everything that they have heard in this individualized culture and they're expected to sort it all out and determine their own identity and their own purpose and their own meaning for life. They're given this broad spectrum of this is what is around. Sorry, one sec. Sorry. They're, they're given this broad spectrum of this is what is around. This is what you have to choose from. And then the teenagers are, are compelled to forge their own path. And you know what? Generally, that's a good thing. We don't, we don't want to just be like stuck in, you know, exactly what your father did or and, and we want the freedom to be able to explore. But there are side effects, which for the past decade, I have been hearing from teenagers for a long time, and we feel it as well as adults, is inside of the freedom to choose and self-identify, there comes great responsibility and great pressure. There comes the pressure to say that, that this is all on me. I have to identify myself. I have to choose my career. I have to choose the way that I'm going to represent in the world. I have to choose everything, and, and this is on me. And, and it's, it's a very hard thing. You know, and, the, and inside of that, the narrative that, that we find ourselves observing from the generations before us, because we all look ahead of us, well, most of us, and so the generations before them are stories of, that are being generated now are stories of hatred and blame and darkness. You know, teenagers today oftentimes, and not all of them, I can't speak for all of them, I won't speak for all of them, but many that have confided in me, have spoken along the lines of, this, of the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes and said, 
it's meaningless. But they don't say meaningless. They say it's, it's futile. It's, 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 it's totally futile. Nothing I do is going to matter. Look at this. When a teenager that, that spoke to me looked at the economy, the news of the future that they heard most often was fear-based and depressing. You'll never be able to buy a home for yourself. How many times have you as an adult heard that in the market today? People, young people could never buy a home for themselves. They're too expensive. When some teachers look at the social structure of the world at large, they see a nation with, to the south that dominates our news, leading them to, to believe that there is a new type of civil war that's being acted out. There's division that, Lord willing, God intervened that there would be unity past this election. And so when some teachers, when some teenagers look at the telos, the purpose of life, they, they say, why, why bother? Because all I'm being offered is, per, is meaningless consumption and ways to, ways to self-medicate to get the next positive thing. It's totally futile. Some teenagers, teenagers that have talked to me, they look at the world to see hope, and what they see is division, racism, persecution of those who are on the other side, hatred and sorrow. You know, all of this is covered up with a pretty bow, and it's all covered up with, the world's going to get better if we just live together, because we live in a land of opportunity, no pressure. And, and, the, and the narrative that comes out to so many teenagers, and again, not all of them, the narrative that comes out is one of total futility. Marriages and families in trouble, sexuality under debate, and judgmentalism everywhere. To what end? Why? Now, that's hard. But I bring it up because, because the church has a different story. As the church, over the past decade, we've learned to muzzle ourselves and to be quiet, to, 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 to not join in with the truth that we have and, and allow the major narrative to become that which I just spoke. doesn't matter what side you're on. In some ways, this is the narrative of our culture. Not just teenagers. We hear it all the time. You know, in fact, in our hardest moments, adults tend to see the total futility around, and we try to make ourselves feel better, too. We tell ourselves that evil is not as near, and we tell ourselves it's not going to happen in, this back, in our backyard. We tell ourselves that if we just go to sleep on time, we'll wake up feeling better tomorrow. We tell ourselves that if we have another drink, or another dessert, or watch another TV show, we can escape for it for now and somehow it'll be gone later. Too often, not all the time, but too often, Christians have used the exact same coping mechanisms that the world has, the same phrases that the world has to offer. And so, we ask ourselves, what should we say? See, we as Christians, in the face of such darkness, we as Christians have been given an eternal hope, right? We've been given an eternal hope. Once again, as we continue down this series, looking at our eternal hope, we have to confront the deepest dark that we do not want to look at. But I want to encourage you today, from Matthew 4 and 16, it says, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The people have, they were in darkness, like I just described. This doesn't describe everybody, but this describes a major cultural narrative that is happening today. The people live in darkness, and a great light can dawn on them. And it says that from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The hope we have is found in Jesus and his establishing of the kingdom of heaven. You know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's, 
It, it's now through the church that God foreshadows his kingdom. It's through us that he goes, you're my hand and my feet. You are the people who show compassion. You are the people who offer a different hope, a different story. And we show compassion and we show light. We discover that Jesus, when he was saying that the kingdom of God is at hand, we discover that, that Jesus is saying God is taking over the show. And he's inviting all humanity into an eternal life and a new way of living. All humanity who have heard a dark and futile story has been invited into a new way of living. And so once again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, once again says, I do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even through Jesus, God will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. For we declare to you that by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God and all the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we, we will always be with the Lord. God has always wanted to live with us. This is the hope we have. You know, so many times this passage has been used as a reason to, to minimize grief. And I hope you've experienced already in this sermon, I do not believe that we should minimize grief. Grieving is important. And shutting down grief with, oh, you're going to see them again, doesn't help. So I want to be clear. We have a hope, but it doesn't mean that we don't grieve. It explicitly says we grieve differently. We grieve differently. We grieve as people who have hope. We have a hope for the world that combats and defeats darkness. Our hope is not based in the economic stock market or our investments in the labor market or if COVID ever goes away. Our hope is not based in the outcome of the election between Trump and Biden because the problems are going to persist. Sorry, that's just true until Jesus sets it all right. It doesn't matter who they vote in, the problems will persist. Our hope is not based on equality or equal access or health care or better education. Our hope isn't based on good jobs or meaningful labor or even what we possess as people. Our hope is based in Jesus answering the question of futility by overcoming all evil. Your fight against evil is not futile because of Jesus. It's not futile to push against darkness because Jesus comes in and he finishes the work. It is with purpose. Did you know the stained glass windows we're, we're privileged to be in a very old traditional building and we have these stained glass windows. You take a look at them. They're beautiful, right? And, and they're very traditional. Not many churches have them anymore. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men, says this one here on my left. And it's just a picture of Jesus and, and some disciples at his feet. Stained glass windows were built in churches because in the pre-electricity world, the towns were oftentimes very dark. And when it was, and it was, when it was dark and dreary, everything was very earthy, especially in the winter months in in Europe, we just did our daylight savings time. They didn't do daylight savings time. So what would happen is the sun would be going down at like 4.30 in the afternoon. And the only light in the town would be from the, from the fires inside the pubs or inside the homes. And, and everything else is just dark. And what they did is they built churches in prominent places and they built them tall and they built them with stained glass windows and they lit the inside of the windows so that the stained glass would be visible from the town all around 
and it would provide light and hope inside the town. It was literally a beacon of hope to the community that the story of Jesus in vast color would be shining out in the night and people can look and say, God can be with us. And there was a story of hope that was built in these stained glass windows. You know, in our world today, we don't see that same, that same effect of stained glass windows because we have neon lights attracting us to all kinds of false hopes. Although, you know, the stained glass in our church is intentional and beautiful, the power is diminished in an electric center because the street lights make it so that there's no contrast between the church building and the world around. But there was a purpose for that contrast, that the people would see and know a hope beyond the darkness. And it was visual. And today the question comes, how do people in our world see hope? How do they hear a contrasting story when as Christians, many of us just tell the same coping mechanisms and the same ideas in the face of darkness that everybody else offers? When we have such a radical, contrasting, different hope, our hope is in the resurrection and the return of Jesus. You know, Christians dying was surprising to the first century church. To be honest, the passage that we read today was actually written as a, as a realization that, oh, Christians are going to die before Jesus returns. There was nobody that expected the return of Jesus sooner than the original disciples. Here they are, Jesus, Jesus died, and he rose again, and, and they go, and they go, oh, well, and, and, and then he leaves, and he ascends up, and he says, I'm going to be back. And the disciples are like, in like an hour? Maybe a couple days. Maybe it's just a couple days. And, and Jesus gave them a mission, go into all the world and, and, and preach the good news. And, and they were like, okay, let's get on it. Maybe that's what it means. And so here they are in the first century. They expand all throughout the Roman Empire. The impetus for that was simply because they believed that Jesus was coming back tomorrow. And so their hope was radically different. Their hope is Jesus has overcome this. He has actually overcome it. And so, and so they, didn't, they expected Jesus' return. And so they had to write this. They wrote this passage going, oh, it is a word from the Lord that those who have passed are going to return with Christ. That God reveals that this is what's happening. And he did it earlier in the Old Testament as well. So it wasn't just a new little thought. It was, it was a whole hope of resurrection. And so Jesus, when he ascended, he told his disciples to be prepared for his return. There's no futility in Jesus' mission and in the mission he gives us. Preparing for Jesus' return when God comes to live with us and make everything right. We can't remain silent any longer. Our hopeful message is needed. It's needed in our world. It's needed in a secular world that, that, that a, a, apparently sees most things as many things as futile. We can't hide behind the worldly coping mechanisms of self-medicating remedies and escapisms. The world needs to see our great hope. Youth today need to see our great hope. And our text in encourages us these two things. We have a message to the world, and our hope is about Jesus and his imminent return. You know, Jesus' return was so imminent, and I just want to give you a picture of what it actually feels like. When I was 10 years old, my parents knew that I was a crazy kid. I had ADHD and all the other whatever letters you want to put after your name. And, uh, and I had all of them, whatever. And so they would not take me into a grocery store because it was a train wreck waiting to happen. And so back in the day before it was wrong to leave your kid in the car, they would leave me in the car. Now, along with ADHD, I had this idea of generalized, um, generalized anxiety as well as I kind of had a problem with like object permanence. So like if I didn't see somebody, they stopped existing. It still happens today. Um, <laughs> my kid disappears from my sight. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they exist anymore. <clears throat> so my parents left me in this car. It wasn't hot and I was 10 so I could have gotten out. It's fine. They said, we'll return. And they went into the grocery store without me. 
And so here I am, I'm in the car, and I'm waiting. And someone comes out of the doors, and I'm like, nope, not that. It's been three minutes. I don't even think they actually made it in the door before I'm looking out the door, waiting for them to come out. And, and I'm waiting, and I'm like, okay, so this per 17 people have gone in. Usually there's like three people in line, which means they're going to be in line in a couple minutes. So if I count to 18, the 18th person is going to be my parents. So I did it. Count all the way to 18. I remember this clearly. It's traumatizing. Seriously, it's terrible. Count to 18. Imminence is palpable. It's palpable. My parents are coming back. They said they were. They're going to be back. I get to 18. Door slides open. She ain't my mom. That is not my mom. Where's my mom? My mom's dead. She's gone. She's never coming back for me. I'm making emergency plans of how I'm going to survive. I'm 10. I'm in the car making emergency plans how I'm going to survive because something terrible has happened. One time I vividly remember this imagination that somehow when my mom was pulling out the milk, the milk bags out of the, out of the freezer, that the milk bags fell on her and crushed her. And I was pretty sure that's what had happened. And so that's why the 19th person and the 20th person wasn't my mom. So now I'm just sitting in the car. I'm restless and I'm anxious. The imminence is palpable. It's right there. I'm just restless. I'm like, when they, when's she coming back? What's wrong? What has happened? What's wrong? And so I'm just, I'm now nervous. 27 people walk out of that store and not one of them is my mom and something's wrong. I'm about to get out of the car. No, I'm, I have to stay. 32 people. I'm going to go find her and rescue her because she's stuck. Something's happened. 32 people have come out of the store and this is wrong. Get out of the car. I can't go in the store because my parents will get mad at me if, if nothing's wrong. But if something's wrong, I'm this hero. I walk around the car and get back in the car. Imminence is palpable. The idea when somebody says, I'm going to be back, they're going to be back. You know, Jesus had risen from the dead and the implication, oh, sorry, my parents came back. Of course they did. They came back with more groceries than I thought and they had a Kit Kat bar for me. That's why Kit Kats are my favorite, Aaliyah. And so, right? Kit Kats are the best. And so all these memes about taking the Reese's Pieces from your candy, from your kids' candy stuff, that's just wrong. You take the Kit Kats. Seriously. So Jesus had just risen from the dead, and the implication was that Jesus defeated death. This stuff's not supposed to bother us anymore. It's supposed to all be better. And, and, and so when Jesus, death, when Jesus returns, death itself is going to bend and break so that we will live eternally with Jesus. Guys, that's our hope. When Jesus returns, death itself is going to bend and break, and we will live eternally with Jesus. Death itself is going to break 2,000 years later, and many people mock and say, well, you know, more than 87 people came out of the grocery store. He's not coming back. It's the exact same thing as saying 2,000 years, Jesus ain't coming back. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish. And when the Bible uses the word perish there, it's not just talking about dying. It's actually talking about eternally being lost. God is not wishing that any of you should be eternally lost, but that each of you should reach repentance. It's not slow because, you know, he forgot or he got stuck under some milk containers in a grocery store. It's slow because in his patience, he doesn't want to see anybody eternally lost. We've seen God active in our own lives and in our testimonies. We've seen the spread of the hope through the entire world, giving humanity a real chance to be united with God and not just a select few. And it's true. Christianity is growing around the world. 
my brother-in-law just just gets here today. Sorry, Luke, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. But he just got out of quarantine, and he's free, and he chose to come to church. Thank you for that. But he lived in Ghana his whole life. And when I went to Ghana, I swear I'd never seen a Christian nation until I walked into the southern cities of Ghana. And, I mean, even their buildings are Christian. Like, it's serious. They, they love Jesus. You know the highway advertisements? They're for churches, not for Sony. And I was like, wow, this country is amazing. I absolutely love Ghana. You know, we see now that God's kingdom is truly a global kingdom that's working into all the nations, into the very fabric of human society. Imminence is still palpable. You know, the fact that my non-church friend says, well, I'm going to be with them again one day, tells me that the story is breaking through. There are slivers of truth around us all the time. And what we get to do is we get to connect the dots. You said that right. You said that you will see him again. But that's for those who are in Christ. And so we look to Christ as the one who overcame death. And we point people to the real hope. We say, here's your sliver of truth that you're holding on to. Let me help fill it out for you. Let me help you understand that the hope is actually in the resurrection, that Jesus overcame death and he's going to make all things right and live with us. Let me help you understand it a little bit more so that their eyes too can be opened. Behold, they have seen a great light. Our real expectation about death is we have trust in God that he will indeed raise us up from the dead and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's what our text says. We have trust in God that he will indeed raise us from the dead. And there's great encouragement in these words. Our hope defeats the pervading sense of total futility. We are here to live with God, here and now. And we are here to show the world that God is making things right. No, we can't fix the tragedies. They happen, and we're there to show that God is there in the grief. We join with, we show compassion, we show love, and we say God is there with you in your grief. We can't take away the fact that tragedies have happened and do happen, but we can foreshadow the hope of God making all things right, of God living with us. God living with us is here when you experience God on a Sunday morning. When we do Lectio and God speaks to your heart directly from Scripture, that's God with us. We feel it and we know it. And so the reality is starkly different to the natural assumptions about death we read in Ecclesiastes last week. The reality is that there's real purpose, real meaning, and eternal life to be had. And it pushes against the darkness of the world that sometimes shows up in my own backyard. There are four ways, and, and I, not, I'm just listing them, so it's going to go fast. There are four ways that reminders of our eternal hope matter. It adds value to your current relationship. If you hold on to this eternal hope, it adds value to your current relationship because you're building the relationship together. The, our text says, encourage each other with these words encourage each other with these words every day becomes important because the world is experiencing darkness every day is important because of the hope we have changes our posture the eternal hope says i will be comforted if we live in war the eternal hope says i will experience peace in fact i could even foreshadow peace if we live in 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 consumerism and purposelessness of that our eternal hope says, I will show somebody else the hope of genuine love, the hope of genuine compassion and care and being there, and that we point it. We don't just do it. We point it to Jesus' faithfulness. It helps us with preparing for the change of relationship. See, death does change our relationship whether you're ready or not. And so when we take time to prepare for death, like I've been talking about over the past couple of weeks, we actually can be more ready for that relationship change. We can be more ready to say, okay, 
that person has, has passed, but I hold them in my memory, and I honor their memory, and I honor them, and I know that I will see them again because they were in Christ. And so it constantly grounds us in our faith in Jesus' resurrection and return. And our faith, I want to say this, and I'm going to say it all next sermon. Our faith is nothing outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, we're going to go through it next week. It says, for this perishable body must put it on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And this is where we find all of our hope. The Christian hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, we've tasted and we've seen the darkness in our backyard. We've cried out to God and we've asked Him for help. And now, in this sermon, my attempt was to reorient our eyes from the, the dark story to the eternal hope of Jesus because we now need to ask God to allow our lives to constantly be encouraged in this hope and not just settle for the escapisms and the remedies of the world because they lead to total futility. We need to ask God to allow us to encourage, to be encouraged in our hope so that we can look to the eternal and we can voice it and be that shining light, that contrasting story to the community around us because we know that God is faithful, that He makes all things right and that He lives with us. So God, it's a tall order today. It's a tall order today because in the face of darkness, the, the, the instant easy is to assume the same position as everybody else and to say the same things. But you call us to have a contrasting hope that a light has dawned in the world. And, and from there, when, when that light dawns, Jesus leads the way by, by saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And this kingdom is a glorious light, hope filled with eternal God with us. It's filled with God making everything right. And so, God, I pray that, that you would continue to teach us how to see the slivers of truth in the world and how to, to allow them to build out to the larger hope that we have, the hope that makes the world not seem so futile, but to fill the world with the color of your light and your love and your eternal glory. And so, God, we are but students. We are learning. And so in this learning journey, I pray that we would find steps that allow us to practice, moments that we're allowed to foreshadow, times when we could be compassionate and, and do it in the name of Jesus. And, God, I pray that we would be that city on a hill that you spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. That we would be that city on a hill, the salt of the earth. God, give us our own dose of encouragement today. And allow us to walk with an eternal perspective, knowing that you carry and give life. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for joining with us today, and I hope that you walk away encouraged, and I hope that you also were able to, to realize that, you know, that we don't want to minimize grief, but we want to just allow God to work in it. Thank you, and uh, may God bless you, and we will see you again next week.